Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. It's a great honor because the conversations we're having today have been heard by the greatest on our continent. This is a conversation which Nkrumah, Lumumba, Du Bois, Padmore, and others had. This is the kind of conversation which led to convening the Faith Pan-African Congress in Manchester and which created the conditions for accelerating the national liberation movement in Africa. Today we are talking about reclaiming our sovereignty. And the first question I'd like to pose is what sovereignty? Which sovereignty? Is it that sovereignty which is defined in terms of our so-called national identity? Is it that sovereignty which is defined within the realm of the many countries that have sprung up on the African continent? Or is it a different kind of sovereignty which enables us as Africans to act together, to fight together, to struggle together, to eliminate poverty, and to move forward on the path of achieving social justice and deeper democracy? Today, there are so many of us when we talk about sovereignty, and we are talking about Nigeria, we are talking about Ghana, we are talking about Togo, we are talking about South Africa, and so on. I think the time has come to rethink the concept of sovereignty. I've traveled across many borders in Africa, and what I see sometimes is absolutely shocking. Only recently, I traveled on the border between Ghana and Togo. And I discovered that on those borders, you find houses. In some of the houses, the bathroom is in Togo and the sitting room is in Ghana. So people who live in these houses, are they Togolese or they are Ghanaians? The facts of our history is that these countries were not created, these borders were not created by us. These borders do not define us. These are borders which were created in 1884, thereabout, where the imperialist countries sat around the table, put the map of Africa on the table, and drew lines across Africa to define their spheres of interest. It had nothing to do with the aspirations of our people. And that is why today, on all of our borders, there is total confusion. You go to the border between La Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, and you find the Nzema people. The majority of them actually live in La Côte d'Ivoire. Their paramount chief lives in La Côte d'Ivoire, and they are divided by a line which was drawn by the colonialists. The time has come for all of us to work relentlessly to pull down these boundaries, because these boundaries define a colonial status. These boundaries are partly responsible for our poverty and underdevelopment, and we need to pull them down now. We need to pull them down now to build that new Africa whose people are united in their common struggle for justice, in their common struggle for emancipation, in their common struggle to control their own resources and to exploit these resources for the benefit of their people. Today, all over Africa, our people are poor, our people's access to education and other social services are limited. We need to ask the simple question, what is responsible for underdevelopment in Africa? What is responsible for the poverty that we see on the streets of Johannesburg? What is responsible for the fact that many of our people have no access to electricity? Here in Joburg, I've been here just two days. Is there a good reason why the lights go off frequently? Is there a good reason why Johannesburg is what it is today? The first day of my arrival, 
I was driving through the streets of Johannesburg, and what I saw is a huge statement about the fact that the struggle against apartheid is not over yet. You drive on the streets of Johannesburg, and what do you see? The street names, German, English. You hardly find a street name which is African. And yet, we wallow in the assumption that we have liberated ourselves from apartheid. Today, you go to Soweto, you go to the shanty towns and so on. Who lives in those shacks? Who are the people who suffer mass employment in this country? The struggle against apartheid is not over. And the earlier we realized that and came together and continued that struggle, for total liberation, the better it will be for all of Africa. One of the problems we face is that we allow them to talk down to us, to tell us what to do. We are told not to follow the Chinese example. We are told not to follow the example of Cuba. We are told not to follow the example of Venezuela and so on. And we are told to follow the example of the United States of America. We are told to follow the example of Germany. We are told to follow the example of France. What is that example? Clearly, the prosperity that the ruling classes in these countries enjoy is not the result of their hard work or the correctness of the ideological and political path. The prosperity they enjoy comes out of the fact that for years, for hundreds of years, our forebears were captured as beasts of burden to work their plantations. They captured the best in Africa. They captured the best architects, the doctors, and so on, and made them work for free in conditions of slavery. Today, they live in relative prosperity because of the colonial adventure because they controlled our resources and they exploited our resources for their own benefit. I look at the railway lines in Ghana and I'm not surprised at our poverty. If you look at the railway lines in Ghana, they all start from areas of concentration of wealth. They start from the gold mines. They start from the diamond mines. They start from the forest where we cut timber and so on. And where do they end up? They do not end up in African factories producing the needs of the African people. They end up at the ports. They end up at the ports because these resources are being taken away to build Europe, to build North America, to enrich the bourgeoisie in those societies. We have to change the story that our railway lines tell us about ourselves and so In any case, those who say that we should follow the American example, those who say that we should follow the German example and so on, I like to ask just one question. Yes, we are ready to follow the example, but first, they must tell us which people we can also go and capture as slaves to work for us for a hundred years without pay. They must tell us which territories in the world today we as Africans can go and colonize. They must tell us what territories in the world today we can establish a new colonial relationship with. If they show us that, perhaps we will follow the example. But until they show us that, there is no way we can follow the example. And even if they showed us that, we have a very high level of morality. We are opposed to slavery, we are opposed to colonialism, and we are opposed to neocolonialism. And therefore, that is not our path to development and prosperity. Our path to development and prosperity lies in our working together to pull down the structures of enslavement, the structures of neocolonial control, to build that new Africa in which no child will go to bed on an empty stomach. That is our task. That is our path. We have been told 
that we Africans are barbarians. We have been told that the Europeans came here to civilize us. That is falsifying history, isn't it? Because we know the story of the Congo. We know the story of King Leopold. And we know that they imputated Africans because they were in a, of, of their inability to supply rubber for the enrichment of the empire in Belgium. What can be more barbaric than amputating, amputating the, the limbs of people because they refuse to be exploited? We know the story of Kenya and we know how the Mau Mau movement was treated. We know the story of South Africa and how apartheid decimated the South African people. And we know the story of Libya, the recent story of Libya, and how Libya has been reduced to rubble. We would not be deceived by these narratives. And we have to work to put forward our own narrative. If you read Nkrumah's book, Africa Must Unite, Nkrumah makes the point that Africa alone has more than 50% of the total resources of the world. Now, if Africa has more than 50% of the total resources of the world, why is there so much poverty and deprivation on this continent? There's so much poverty and deprivation on this continent because we have failed to realize the dreams of our forebears. We have failed to realize the dreams of Toussaint Olivater and others. There's so much poverty on this continent because we no longer control our resources and exploit these resources for a benefit. I come from Ghana in West Africa. And only last week, I saw some statistics which were deeply worrying. Ghana, Ghana, which was the vanguard of the liberation struggle. Ghana, which provided 10 million pounds in order that the Guinean revolution would start and survive. Ghana, which provided 10 million pounds also to Zambia for Kawunda to lead the nationalist movement to victory and so on. Ghana, which played <coughs> a leading part in the struggle against apartheid and so on, has now simply been reduced to rubble. Today, Ghana needs 128% of its total national revenue for two items, debt servicing and public sector emoluments. Ghana is broke. Now, Ghana is broke. And how is Ghana broke? Ghana is the leading producer of gold in Africa. Ghana is the fifth largest producer of gold in the world. Ghana is the second largest producer of cocoa. Ghana has many resources. The country is crisscrossed by rivers. It has the largest man-made lake in the world. And yet, Ghana has been reduced to rubble. Ghana is bordered on the south by the Atlantic Ocean. It has the Volta River running all the way from the northmost part of the country into the Atlantic Ocean and so on. And yet Ghana is an importer of fish. We import toothpicks, toothpicks. After you have eaten and you have those remnants between your teeth and so on, that small stick you use to remove them is imported by Ghana. We import virtually everything and so on. What happened to us? How are we getting out of this situation? Because if we don't get out of this situation of reliance on imports and so on, we would never be able to assert a sovereignty. The path to our liberation lies in our taking full control of all of our resources and exploiting those resources for the benefit of our own people. This is the path. 
And this part is only realizable under the guidance of scientific socialism. There is no other way. Now, comrades, I just mentioned that we are the largest producer of gold in Africa. What does that mean? What does that mean when our central bank signs an agreement with these mining companies which says that the mining companies can retain 98% of the value of gold that is exported from Ghana? What does that mean when Ghanaian interest in mining is only 3%? Being the largest producer of gold in Africa, what does that mean when we are able to finance education where we are unable to improve the housing stock, where we are unable to enhance access to healthcare and so on. What does that simply mean? These are the things that we need to reflect on when we come to be talking about reclaiming our sovereignty. We have already heard a lot about foreign military bases on our continent. And I feel sad that Ghana is hosting one of these foreign military bases. Now, if you read the terms under which these military bases are established on our continent, you feel sad. You feel hopeless. In Ghana, we have allowed the United States of America to establish its military base on our soil. Under the agreement which allows the U.S. to establish this military base, our head of state is stopped from entering that territory. The U.S. military base is not accessible even to the head of state. As if that was not enough, in the agreement, we have committed to an arrangement under which if U.S. soldiers come to, the, to Ghana and kill Ghanaians, Ghanaians cannot go to court to ask for redress. We have committed ourselves to an arrangement under which property destroyed by US soldiers in Ghana, if your property is destroyed by US soldiers in Ghana, you cannot go to court. We have given our frequencies for the use of the US military for free. Our frequencies are given to the US forces for free. When Ghanaians have to pay millions in order to get frequencies to establish radio stations and television stations and so on, the U.S. can take it for free. <coughs> Excuse me. Under the agreement, U.S. soldiers entering Ghana are not subject to inspection. They are not subject to search. You can't search them. You can't look through their bags. You can't examine what is on their body. And when they leave, they are also not subject to customs inspection. They cannot be searched. U.S. soldiers do not need passports to enter Ghana. They don't need passports to enter Ghana. All they need is their ID cards. Under these circumstances, we have given U.S. soldiers privileges way and above diplomats. Because even the American ambassador needs a passport to enter Ghana. A U.S. soldier does not need a passport to enter Ghana. In any case, what are these soldiers doing on our continent? What are they doing on our continent? Our leaders must ask themselves some interesting questions. Of course, they say that there's a global village, whatever that means, but they say that there's a global village. If this is a global village as they define, then everybody has interest everywhere. Now, if we decided to station a battalion of the US, of, of the Ghanaian army in Washington, what would happen? Now, if the US would not allow us to station a battalion in Washington, why do we then allow them to station a battalion on our soil? Ab initio, this arrangement means that we have accepted that we are inferior. And that is one of the reasons why we need to wake up and dismantle these arrangements in order to establish our equality and so on. 
I suspect that I'm already speaking more than 15 minutes, but I think that it would be inappropriate if I do not touch on the question of Ukraine, the current question. Ukraine, what has that got to do with our sovereignty? A lot. As we speak, many African countries are in situations of war. As we speak, 80% of the land territory of Burkina Faso has been taken up by insurgents. Only last week, eight soldiers of the Togolese armed forces were slaughtered by Islamic insurgents. Two weeks ago, the northern border of Benin was attacked. As we speak, West Africa is in turmoil. Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria, is, is, is on fire by Boko Haram insurgents and so on. There's a low-intensity civil war in the Niger Delta and so on. Somalia is becoming a failed state and so on. Nobody talks about these developments on the African continent. We are all told to focus on Ukraine. Why? Why Ukraine? What is my worry with Ukraine when West Africa is burning and nobody is talking about West Africa? What is my worry with Ukraine when there is war all over Africa? I think that the time has come for us as Africans to begin to think about how to build our own nations and how to free our own nations from the ravages of war and so on. As we are being told to join Ukraine in the preservation of democracy and so on, we see pictures of Africans in Ukraine who also want to flee the war like the Ukrainians and who are refused access to buses taking people out of the war zone. There's a story of a Nigerian student who had to work for 12 hours because Ukrainian security people decided that the buses that were taking people to Poland were not for Africans. If the Ukrainians would not respect us and treat us with dignity, like all other people, like themselves and so on, what business do we have wasting our time, our energy, our resources, our brain power on defending Ukraine? We Africans are not inferior to any race. And we must insist on the fact that we have the same faculties of like all people all over the world. And we are not ready to compromise on our dignity. In any case, if you look at the war in Ukraine, my comrades and friends, the war in Ukraine, look at those fighting the war. Who supported us in our struggle against apartheid? It was certainly not the United States of America. It was certainly not NATO. The support we had to fight for our dignity, to stand up for who we are and so on, came from the Russians. It came from China. It came from Cuba. It came from Cuba, who sent an internationalist force into Angola. It came from Cuba, whose armed forces surrounded the armed forces of apartheid South Africa and forced them to surrender in the Battle of Quito Carnaval. It came from the Cuban internationalists who forced the apartheid regime to capitulate. We cannot forget our friends and we cannot forget our history. We have friends and we have a history that we need to protect and we have interest to protect as African people. The battle for the liberation of Africa must continue, and it is indeed continuing, and we would not stop until Africa is fully liberated from the clutches of exploitation, from neocolonialism, and from the underdevelopment which is imposed upon us by capitalism. We must win this battle, and we will surely win the battle. We win the battle under the banner of Pan-Africanism and Socialism, and nothing will stop us. Comrades, thank you.
Thank you so much for your inputs, Comrade Pratt. So I want to swiftly introduce the next speaker so we can continue.